We've talked a lot so far about pattern recognition, and there's one more very important pattern that I want to impart on you in this video, and that is the pattern of electron donating and electron withdrawing groups. Donating and withdrawing groups actually bear a lot of similarities to the electron sources and sinks, but where distinguishing good from bad donating and withdrawing groups comes in, we have to start thinking about stability trends and what makes a good electron source and a good electron sink. So we'll dive into that a little bit in this video. So what is an electron donating group? Let's begin with the electron donating groups which feature electron sources. Well, really at their root, they're just functional groups or substructures within molecules that have the ability to donate electrons to whatever they're attached to. Electron donating groups have good electron sources associated with them. Typically, this is a lone pair. In rare cases, it can be a pi bond or a sigma bond, but most commonly we see a lone pair as the key source of electrons that makes a good electron donating group a good donating group. And the kinds of electron flow that you see begin with this lone pair. In fact, we saw that in the video featuring electrophilic aromatic substitution. This naturally begs the question, what makes a non-bonding lone pair such a good electron source, and more generally, how do we know what makes a good or bad electron source? This is going to influence how we think about electron donating groups. Well, there are a number of factors that figure into this, and I'll just mention a few here. If we compare the electron donating group featuring oxygen, let's call it an ether, let's say, to the donating group featuring nitrogen, we can see that the key difference here is just the atom type or the elements of the atom that's associated uh, with the donating group. The electronegativity of the element is the key to its donating power. So nitrogen is less electronegative than oxygen, which makes it a better electron donor. It's more readily able to donate its pair of electrons than oxygen is. Consider an example like this. Uh, say we have a carbon with a lone pair. Let's make it a carbanion. We have a carbon with a double bond attached, and we have a carbon with a single bond attached. How will these compare in electron donating power? Well, ignoring the influence of the charge for a second, which is going to ramp down the electronegativity of that carbon atom massively, the lone pair is going to be our best electron source. Non-bonding lone pairs are strong electron donors, all other things being equal. The double bond will be number two. So the pi bond of a double bond or triple bond is a decent electron donor and comes in at the number two strength. And then sigma bonds will be the worst electron donors. This has to do with the orbital energy, really, of the sigma orbital and the pi orbital and the non-bonding lone pair orbital. We'll get into that in more detail in a future lesson, but the trend is worth knowing now. Non-bonding lone pairs are the strongest, pi bonds come in at number two, and sigma bonds are your lowest energy or most stable electron sources. And so your most common electron donating groups, as I mentioned before, will feature non-bonding lone pairs. All right, what about electron withdrawing groups? What's the story with these? Well. Essentially, they have the opposite function from electron donating groups. They withdraw electron density, and kind of like the electron sinks, they're a little bit less intuitive, I think, to spot. But the fundamental idea here is that every electron withdrawing group has some kind of good electron sink associated with it, and that is typically either a double or triple bond to an electronegative heteroatom. Why does this make a good electron sink? Well, again, this begs the question, what makes a good electron sink? The strongest electron sinks will actually be the empty atomic orbitals, like the carbocation, the empty A's. These are the strongest because they're the lowest energy unfilled orbitals. Moving up a notch, you can imagine that the trend continues. The pi bond will come in at number two, pi star as an acceptor, and then the weakest of the electron acceptors will again be the sigma bond. 
the sigma star. And the root cause of this, again, is the orbital energies. Electronegativity-wise, when we increase the electronegativity of that atom right there, we're making the bond a better electron sink because it's better able to inherit electrons through electron flow like this. Just to give you an example here, notice that the pi star acceptor here is involved, and when the X atom is electronegative, we're looking at a relatively important, relatively stable resonance form and features a negative charge on an electronegative element. This is called electron withdrawing behavior because you'll notice that the positive charge that's left behind in this resonance can be quenched by something coming from the attachment point. So if more electrons are available at the attachment point, they can come and sort of fill that gap. So in this way, the unsaturated system to an electronegative heteroatom withdraws electrons from whatever it's attached to. To recognize electron withdrawing groups, again, look for double or triple bonds associated with electronegative heteroatoms. And these include things like the carbonyl group, the nitrile, and the granddaddy of them all, which is the nitro group. The nitro group benefits not only from having electronegative oxygen atoms associated with it, but also a positive charge on the central nitrogen atom, which makes this an even stronger electron withdrawing group.